This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hi, everybody. Cheryl Kay from Unleashed, and we have a very interesting show today. We have Nicole Yukum from Animal Farm Foundation, and she's going to explain to us everything she does because it is a long list. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you guys so much for having me today. I am so happy to have the opportunity to be here and talk about the work that we do. Let's start off with explaining how you got into this because you really do a lot of wonderful things from A to B all the way down to Z when it comes to rescuing, training, and transporting, correct? Yeah. So Animal Farm Foundation has a bunch of different programs that are centered around keeping dogs and people together to end discrimination. So at our farm located in upstate New York, we have dogs there that are training to be service dogs, dogs that we find from shelters that we transport from shelters across the country. And then they go on to do some training and go on to be service dogs, or they'll go on to just be adopted out as pets. And sometimes the dogs before they get their service dog training, they go into our Paws of Purpose program, which is a program at Rikers Jail in New York in Queens. And they get their basic training there. It's been a really great program, really great for us to get to know the dogs um, because that environment, you know, you're going to see a lot of different behaviors in dogs. And then we get to learn if they're going to be great to do public access service dog stuff or if they're going to go on and, and be pet dogs. That socializes them also, I would imagine. Absolutely. They get a lot of socialization in there. The participants in there really love the dogs, spoil them for sure. (laughs) They get a lot of peanut butter treats in Rikers. Oh, oh, okay. (laughs) And I have to state, most of you dogs are pit bull mixes, correct? Because we work to end discrimination, a lot of the dogs uh, that we get are labeled pit bulls in shelters because they're the ones that uh, do face a lot of the discrimination. I just want to get it out there because one thing about those dogs, they smile (laughs) (laughs) and they are, I, I know they use them a lot for detection, for canines. They are wonderful dogs. So let's just get it out there that it's not the dog. It could be the owner that gives yeah. these dogs a bad rap. So I, I think it's so important to just look at every dog as an individual, uh, no matter what they look like or what their breed is. And I do think responsible ownership is very important. It is important to be a responsible owner if you are a dog owner, no matter what your dog looks like. And now do you do any work with uh, veterans for when you do, uh, you know, service dogs? Um, We have placed a dog with a veteran, but we do all different types of service dogs. We have placed a hearing dog, mobility dog, psychiatric service dogs. Okay. So when you get these dogs out of a shelter, there must be an underlying personality or one single trait or maybe more that would let you know this is the kind of dog that could either be for detection, service, comfort, or you know, uh, they have to be on a farm with other animals because maybe they can't be rehomed. So is there one kind of a trait or a couple of traits that you could let our listeners know? Because I think it would help when people rescue animals to begin with. What makes a good service dog? So to be a service dog, you really have to be good with everything because you're going to be out in the public. You're going to be going into restaurants and stores and you need to be extremely well behaved. So we go out and we take a look at the dogs in the shelters and we want to see what their personality is like. Are they paying attention to us? Are they good with other animals? They can't, you know, they can't want to run off and and run after a squirrel or something. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) They can't be prey driven. (laughs) <laughs> to have some fun. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good to be good with other dogs, but also we don't want them to run out a dog when they're supposed to be working. Now you train these dogs, correct? I do not train them uh, personally, but we do train them at our facility. Um, we have a director of behavior and training as well as two wonderful girls that train the dogs there to be service dogs. And now how long would it take to train a dog for service? 
It really depends on the dog and what the person that is receiving the dog needs and what tasks we have to train them for. So it could vary from six months to a year to two years. Plus we do after training. We provide any training after the dog leaves if the clients need more training. Okay. So you stay with the uh, person who would, you know, adopt this dog or get this dog. So it's not, and I guess, you know, they could learn on their own also what their dog is capable. Because really, when you take a rescue dog out of a shelter, you really don't get to know them for months because, you know, they could be traumatized. They've been in a cage. It takes a long time for an animal to, you know, build up the trust with their new human and kind of get the lay of the land. And I find also that a lot of people who rescue bigger dogs, they usually have other dogs in the home. So they kind of learn what it's like to be a dog, you know, whether or not they were dropped off by previous owners, you know, we don't really know their past or they were just out on the street and never in a home. You know, some animals are scared. So I think it's also good when these rescue animals go into a home where there is another animal because it teaches them how to be a dog, how to lay on the couch, how to chill out and how to have their food and not worry about somebody else in the next bowl is going to take their food. So I could understand that it takes a long time. Yeah. And fosters are really great people that foster dogs. They really get to know their dogs right? in a home environment, uh, which is really helpful for us to know how the dogs are acting in, in a home environment. Right. And a lot of those have other animals too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, thank God for organizations like you, because what would happen to all these animals? I mean, the saddest thing is millions are put down a year for no other reason than there's not enough people who are willing or can adopt. Yeah. And one of the reasons why people surrender their dogs to animal shelters is because of home insecurity. Um, And that's another one of the programs that we have is we are working to eliminate breed specific policies in the insurance industry. And that I think will help a lot of shelters having to intake dogs because people are having to choose between their home or their pet, which I don't think anybody should have to do. No, no. I'm, I know that there are some states or I guess apartment buildings or areas where you can't have a big dog over 25 pounds or you can't have this breed of dog. And it's heartbreaking because some parents have bad kids that go out and rob or whatever. I mean, I know it's an animal, but for us who have animals, they really are our family. Yeah. And with more people renting right now and with landlords saying they can't allow certain breeds of dogs because of their insurance policy, it's so important to to remove those exclusionary policies in the insurance industry. So that opens up housing for everyone. Now, are there certain insurance companies that you deal with or that our listeners could be in tune to as far as maybe some people listening might be in the market to go to a different area and rent? I mean, there's a big migration going on now in the country of people moving, things are being shaken up. Yeah. So any specific key they should look for or avoid? Uh, Well, it's really hard because there's only a very small amount of insurance companies that don't have any of these breed restrictions. State Farm is the biggest one if you are looking for insurance, but sometimes, you know, you're not able to get coverage through State Farm. And I think it's really important because the majority of the insurance companies out there do have these baseless exclusionary policies. So we really want to work to get consumers to we've created a website so they can go out and reach out to their insurance commissioners because they're there to protect insurance consumers and let them know like, hey, I've been having trouble with insurance companies providing me insurance solely on the way that my dog looks. And something needs to be done about this. Right. So this would, you know, either it's homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance for sure. Yeah, both. And that would happen at when you take the policy, they ask questions like that. Yeah. So a bunch of different ways this could happen. One is when you're going to get a new policy, they might exclude you because of your dog or ask you to pay a higher premium, which really affects people of lower incomes to be able to afford those premiums and to be able to keep their pets. Yeah. So there's a lot of 
impact to consumers of lower to media incomes to uninformed consumers and you know insurance industry in general is a little bit confusing so i think it's important for people to know that they have those commissioners out there to help them when they run into these problems we're going to take a break and when we come back i want you to give our listeners your website because it's a great website and it has almost everything on there so we'll be right back after a sponsor Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There's no other pet related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Pet We're back and we're talking to Nicole Yukum from AnimalFarmFoundation.org. And she's going to give us her website. It is a charity. So if you do want to donate, you certainly can. Nicole, what is the, the website? The website is AnimalFarmFoundation.org. There's a donate button right on the website. And there's also right on the homepage is a link to learn more about the insurance project. Okay. Do you have volunteers that work with you in your area? I mean, how many animals do you have at the farm? So it's a pretty small uh, facility right now. We have five dogs. We do have a couple volunteers that come and help us out and some great staff to work with them. Okay. And do you have any other animals besides dogs? We do actually. Okay. I want to (laughs) hear. So we mainly work with dogs, but I think people are surprised to hear we have some sanctuary cows on the property that will live their life out there. And we have rescue horses as well, some retired horses. And actually just our director that lives on property also has a donkey and goats. Well, donkeys and goats, they protect the property. Yeah, I heard that donkeys are are good for that. Oh, yeah. The coyotes they'll kick, away. They'll kick, you know, coyotes <laughs> and and all kinds of things. And cows have become the biggest mushes in the world right now. Oh, that, they're so you know, adorable. They they're... are. They are loving. I mean, first of all, you give a cow or a horse one of those big balls in a field. They play with it just like... <laughs> just like a dog with a little ball. It's just amazing. Yeah. We have so much that we could learn from animals. Now, in, in looking over your website, and you are on Facebook, so people could find you there as well. You have grants available. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, we do. We have a couple grants available. Our grants are focused around projects that are keeping people and pets together. So if you're an organization that's working to do like co-housing shelters or things like that that are designed around making sure that people do not have to give up their pets when they're faced with disaster situations or domestic violence situations. So any program centered around that we're interested in hearing about for our grants. We also have a removing breed labels grant that we're offering to shelters that have removed breed labels, just as an initiative to say thank you so much for um, being honest and open with your adopters and all the mixed dogs entering the shelter. We really don't know what their breed labels are. You can't look at a dog and know what it is if it's a mixed breed dog. So we promote to shelters to just tell tell your adopters, we don't know. We don't know what this dog is. Um, and that leads to a lot less uh, stereotyping of who the dog's going to be based on an arbitrary label. Now, now, the dogs that you train at the farm, you send them throughout the country. It's not just New York or New Jersey or Connecticut. It's where they're needed, especially for the detection dogs. 
Um, we don't do the detection dog training that's done in Texas through a detection dog trainer. And our service dog training program is done on site. And because we do a ton of aftercare training, we work with people that live within an hour and a half, two hours from us because we have to go out, you know, we're a small staff and we have to go out and assist them with training. So we keep it fairly local. Okay. I've talked to a few people who train service dogs and the client, you know, the, the new owner, they get the dog, they bond with the dog, and then they meet for the training. So do you do something like that? Or you get the dog, and then you reach out to people who are looking for a service dog or a comfort dog? Well, there's a difference with comfort. Yeah, there's emotional support dogs is not something that we do. We mainly focus on service dogs. And we try to do our best to match the dogs with the clients to make the best matches. So the clients will come to the facility and meet the dogs and see what dog will work best for them. But it's also really important to make sure that we provide them with a dog that's going to suit the, what needs and what tasks that they need to do. Okay. And then they do the training at your facility. It's not they don't go home and bond or they just visit the dog there every day, once a week, twice a week to get to know the dog. Yeah. I mean, it'll depend on the client. We do the initial training and the clients will come in for initial training, but then the dogs will go home and then they'll get to spend more time with the dogs in their home while we continue to do more training and while they get to know their dogs. And you teach them to instill this in the animal because, you know, a lot of people who get their animals trained, they go home and they said, okay, he's trained. That's it. It's, you know, I got my oil changed and I'll drive the car for another six months and then I'll get another one. But it is something that you have to keep doing. You have to keep reassuring the animal, building the trust and keep training the animal what you learned at the farm, correct? Yeah, I mean, we try to make sure that all of the clients go home with the tools that they need to continue the dog's work and make sure the dogs continue on doing their tasks and the work that they're doing. So have you had some really smart dogs that you could teach via Zoom during the pandemic? (laughs) Like sit (laughs) and stay? (laughs) <laughs> Some so- social distancing yeah, uh, training. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to instill in the animal that they are being trained. You know, you walk down the street. I don't care what kind of dog it is. You know how kids are. People are beautiful dog. Oh, can I touch him? No, the dog is in training. I'm getting to know my dog. The person who's the owner has got to be got to be the alpha, not the dog. Yeah, it's about training the dog, but it's also about training the person. Yeah, providing the the person with the uh, situations, uh, scenarios that they need so that they're able to act in those scenarios when they don't want someone to pet their dog in public. Because when you see a dog, you want to pet it, but you know, you're not supposed to. (laughs) Right. I, I know they wear the jackets, right? In training or something. Yeah, they don't technically they don't have to wear the jackets. But um, most the ones I've seen have that some sort of vest on, but I think it's always important with any dog to make sure that you're asking whether or not you can um, engage with that dog or not. So as far as Rikers, you have a lot of the dogs going there. I mean, that might, that's probably a great program. Uh, yeah, it's been really rewarding on both sides. We, um, because of COVID, we had a little bit of a lull uh, with having, being able to zoom, work with zoom them. It. <laughs> yeah, zoom, zoom the dogs in. Um, but yeah, the, the, it's been really rewarding. The, the basic training and the tricks that these guys um, teach the dogs has been, it's just very rewarding uh, for us as well, just to see the connections that are happening Um, The violence in the units the dogs are in has gone down uh, to next to nothing. Two living people, not people, but two living beings getting second chances at something. Yeah. Your organization has been around since the 80s. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. That's wonderful. So you must have, you have a yearbook? (laughs) (laughs) We should. We should have a yearbook. Uh, I've, I started about eight years ago, um, and it's just amazing to see the changes that we have made. Even since I've been here, we also work a lot with breed-specific legislation across the country and are removing those policies that restrict certain breeds in cities and towns across the country. Um, just so many changes that have happened. I'm so grateful to work at and 
an organization that makes this much change. Now, do you have uh, yourself some type of training before you uh, came on board or just a lover of animals? (laughs) I've always loved animals. I actually started at Animal Farm as an administrative assistant. So I was just doing like computer related work. And as the years went on, I got more and more involved. You know, I was, you know, researching and learning as I went sort of thing. Um, So that was my training, more experience based. Now, the animals that you have on the farm, the five that you have, they mingle with the other animals there? Not with the cows or the goats. I mean, they'll come up to the fences and say hi, but they don't they're not in the fences together with because, you know, if you and if they're going to people local in your area, I mean, there's some big properties where you are. So they might end up on a farm. Yeah. So, I mean, we want to make sure that the dogs are good with everything. So we'll walk them past the goats and make sure, you know, there's no issues there, but we wouldn't want to put them like in with the cows. That would be dangerous. Really? Well, the cows are big cows. (laughs) Oh, oh, okay. (laughs) The cows are very large. I only know of cows that are large. (laughs) Although, you you know, you see on these videos, these, these wonderful people who have ranches and farms and, you know, the mother rejected the cow and they had to bring the cow and the alpaca in the house and it has to stay in the bedroom because they got to feed them a bottle. They always have these big bottles. If this happened to me, I wouldn't even know where to get these items. <laughs> you know, it's I mean, it's just amazing how there are so many different rescues out there. It really is, really is wonderful. Is there anything else you want to talk to us about or have our listeners know about? I want you to repeat again your website. And, you know, maybe if there's people in your area there, we go all over. Maybe there's somebody who wants to pitch hay. (laughs) Yeah, um, our website again is animalfarmfoundation.org. And I really encourage your listeners if they've faced any issues within the insurance industry and finding um, an insurance policy or are struggling to find a rental property because of the breed restrictions in the insurance industry to head over to our website. We've made it super easy for you to get connected with your state insurance commissioner and let them know that these policies are affecting you because it's their jobs to protect you. And the more people that reach out, the more people that let the insurance commissioners know that this is an issue, the more likely they're going to look into the issue and make changes within the policies in the insurance industry. That's great. And it's not just for the mixes that we talked about. It could be shepherds. It could be any big animal. Yeah. Insurance companies, uh, breed lists run from like 10 to 20 breeds, Rottweilers, Dobermans, German Chapters, Huskies, Akitas. You never really know if you're going to be targeted by these insurance lists. So no little chihuahuas. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. They might be on some. You never know. The lists are pretty long. Jeez, that is amazing. Somebody must have come up with that. That obviously is not an animal lover. That's for sure. Yeah, we can't, we couldn't find any data. There's no reliable data or science that backs up these lists, no actuarial data. So we're not sure why the insurance companies are using these lists. So I think it's time for them to get rid of them. I saw on a Hallmark show, I think it was last year, I think it was a town in Colorado and they were banning a certain type of dog and the dog was smarter than all of the officers. And he was a great dog. I mean, he, he did, you know, wonderful things. He was not a problem, but it was a whole rigmarole. But, you know, I guess they must have got it from, you know, the papers. I like to ask all of my guests, do you have pets? I do. I have one dog. Okay. What kind? Big, little, small? He would probably be considered a pit bull in a shelter. He's a brindle boy. He's a big boy. He's about 65 pounds. Okay. That's, that's big. Yeah. And I'm sure he smiles. He smiles all the time. He loves to sunbathe. He's a big time sunbather. Yeah. They love the sun and they really are. I mean, beautiful animals. I just read something yesterday that they've discovered dogs laugh. Oh, really? Yeah. How about that? (laughs) (laughs) That's wonderful. Well, I want to thank you for coming on. And I want to um, let our listeners know you have the website handy. And if you want any information, you could contact me at unleashedtalk at gmail.com. 
Nicole, I want to thank you. I hope to have you back again, and we'll see how things are going with you. I want to thank Mark, and have a great day, and hear from you next time. Remember, live life unleashed. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.